when I'm in your shoes, I like the court to be loud. In my day, I listened to a lot of Aerosmith and Kiss, and um, I think I've lost about 10%, so I want it to be loud so everyone can hear it. As a state legislator, what we do is we make laws for Kentucky, and one of the laws that I made recently was House Bill 232, and we're going to talk about how that came to be. But before I get into all the fun details of that, I wanted to um, point out some things that I saw when I was in the parking lot and you all were arriving. I thought it was interesting to watch the tech people come into the parking lot because you were looking at your phones coming into the parking lot. And I said, that, this is the right conference. And they got out of the car, you all got out of your car, you had your phone in your hand, and you were still staring at it. You stared at it all the way in. And I thought, I'm at the right conference, I'm at the right place. Just want to remind you, we did pass a law against no texting and driving. And uh, while I'm not allowed to issue tickets because I'm not law enforcement, I could have issued it to you as you were coming in. And I worked on that law quite a bit too. And I wanted it to be so appealing to make you stop your work on your phone that we made the fine $25. And you say, well, that's ridiculous, wouldn't you? Most of you out there saying, well, if you want to stop people to do it, it should be a $500 fine. Well, unfortunately, in this case, we don't have a czar. We have a legislature, and it's called a democracy. And you have to have a majority of people that support it before you pass it. And so it may have started out at a $100 fine, it got moved down to a $50 fine, and then it started out, then it ended up a $25 fine in order to get enough votes to pass. So that is your kind of basic, um, your basic lesson on democracy. There's a lot of things that we might want to get done and fix and do, but it has to have the approval of a whole lot of other people. And there's a lot of people along the way that don't want to see it in that particular form the way it's proposed. Because they have real life experiences that may improve it or make it better. For example, when that legislation, no texting while driving, was passed, the discussion was, um, it's a terrible, terrible thing to do. It's like being drunk. It's worse than being drunk and driving. A lot of accidents. We had people who had been in accidents and survived, had loved ones killed. There was a lot, of, you know, a lot of discussion about how dangerous texting and driving is. So we basically outlawed it for kids of a certain age, 18 and under. Um, and one of the things that I saw was that, well, what if you're sitting in Louisville this is an example of how um, a local representative's experience flavors the legislation or changes it. What if I'm sitting on Marsh Expressway because there's a wreck and I know it's about a 15 or 20 minute delay? Should I be subject to a fine because I look at my phone or text? I'm sitting still on the road. What if I'm in a railroad track and it takes three minutes? So the folks who were behind this bill were more rural in nature, and I don't think they understood that we have traffic congestion in Louisville, or in Lexington, or northern Kentucky, or Bowling Green. And so they didn't really like the idea because they thought that um, that would encourage people to look at their phone. But I realized that people were going to do it anyway. And people would say, well, you know, how are you going to enforce that? We can't have a law like this. Cops can't enforce that. How is the cop going to enforce that? No text. How do they know you're just not talking on your phone or looking to see if it's ringing? So we can't have that law. We, we, we shouldn't. People voted no because cops can't enforce it. Well, you can't base public policy on what cops can enforce and can't enforce because a lot of public policy is what we, how we want you to behave how we want you to be safe. You have to set policy in place, that way you can tell your teenager that it's against the law. You can't do that. You might not, have, you might not throw the whole thing, the fine is very little, and they can pay it with three hours of babysitting work, but you tell them that that's the policy, that's the procedure, that's what we want in Kentucky. So we overcame this objection that you all can see on little technical points. The police can't enforce it, so we shouldn't do it. 
The point wasn't to give the police a lot more work. The point was we needed to have some sort of public policy in Kentucky that most of us could agree with and try to live towards and try to meet those standards. Because without those standards, um, you would have a lot more texting and driving. Which brings me to House Bill 232. I go to conferences like you all do, and I enjoy them. Uh, the conferences I go to, uh, the ones that I particularly enjoy, are when all 50 states get together and they talk about um, laws in other states and problems, and a lot of the problems are the same, a lot of the challenges are the same. You need to learn from other lawmakers to see what they do. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. And when I learned about protecting uh, identity, I found out that we, there were 46 other states that did it. We were on the list that was given to me. We didn't have any law dealing with how companies in Kentucky are supposed to protect your identity. Your credit card, your name, your social security number, things of that nature. I thought that was amazing. I thought, matter of fact, I was kind of surprised. I thought, well, I thought we worked on that. I thought we did that. And so I had to do a little research, and I called the Legislative Research Commission. And in fact, in 2006, we had a bill, and we did pass it in the House, and the Senate said, no, that's too much government, too much oversight. Can't do that. And so it, it didn't get anywhere. That was in 2006. We would have been among the first 15 states. And so it languished until I brought it up and explained that it wasn't too much government. So that's kind of interesting to explain is that that was surprising. I, I didn't realize that we didn't have it. It's kind of odd when you're in the House um, and there's a hundred of us in the House and 38 in the Senate. It's almost like two different states many times. They're so busy in the House with my 45,000 constituents. My district is uh, southeast Jefferson County, and Heights, a little bit of St. Matthews, Heights Point, a lot of J-Town, a little bit of Fern Creek. Does anybody live there? Raise your hand. 402, 20, 14. Oh, good, good. Um, because my political consultant got mad at me yesterday and said, don't you go speak there? How oh, many people can't vote for you? <laughs> Hung up on me. Wasting your time. Can't do that. But we have enough, we have more obligation than just winning our race in November. Of course, I want to win, but we have a bigger obligation than that, too, as lawmakers. So, talking about surprises, I want to get off base a little bit, because people say, well, when you talk to folks, tell them, a lot of people want to know, you know, what's it like to be a state representative? What surprises you? And, and so on and so forth. I, we're, we're considered part-time citizen legislators. I'm married. My, my wife is an elementary school teacher at Camp Taylor Elementary. And I have two kids, a 22-year-old and a 17-year-old, and I've been in office more than 20 years. So I've, I've run a lot of races, and I've won a lot every time. And I still like what I do. People say, well, why? You know, you've been there long enough. But I like what I do, and, and I'm still engaged with it, and I um, like learning new things. I like talking about policy. So I feel like I have something to give back, and that's basically what it is, I think. As you do, the things you're interested in, you just give back because you've done well with something and you want to give back. We, we're considered part-time citizen legislators. We kind of make fun of that among each other because most of us aren't really part-time because we're available evenings and weekends. And we do things like this on evenings and weekends. And it's not technically part-time. It's supposed to be, but all of us, most of us have real jobs unless we're retired. We have... Guess what our number one occupation is? It's not um, IT professionals like you. <laughs> Guess what it is? Lawyers. Lawyers. I'm an insurance broker. In my real life, I insure businesses. So that's what I do in my real life. And there's farmers. There's, there's a few teachers, one or two accountants, uh, small business people. So the legislature is made up of a lot of people that have... Um, a lot of interest all over the state. Whatever we, we have some retired educators, retired teachers, folks that have been in uh, education administration. So it's a good it's a good mixture of, of um, 
of professionals and so on and so forth. The, the things that surprised me as a legislator, well, first of all, who would pick Paraket as their name for their conference center? <laughs> when Conrad asked me to come, I said, you mean Parakeet? I've never been here before, this is my first time. No, Paraket. I said, Para what? <laughs> so I thought, maybe there needs to be a marketing conference here, because nobody knows what a Paraket is. Does anybody know what a Paraket is? Raise your hand, raise your arm. What is a Paraket? Everybody bother to look it up? Maybe I'll learn later. I just thought it was a big surprise. Uh, another thing that surprises a lawmaker, these are things I want to get into just for entertainment sake before we talk about this bill, is uh, the, the, the issue of immigration, how it's come down to the state level, which it's a federal issue and, and illegal immigration. We have an immigration system that's broke, broken, it needs to be fixed, and nobody wants to step forward to fix it. I was surprised we uh, worked on a bill uh, that came to my committee. My committee is called Local Government. I'm chair, I'm chair of a committee called Local Government. We break up into committees, and, we, and those committees deal with specific topics. And so, a local government would do what? We have jurisdiction over cities, counties, and special districts. Special districts are quasi government groups. Uh, TARC, you don't know what TARC is, is a special district. The airport is a special district. Uh, Pleasure Ridge Park Fire District. In your fire district, Linden Fire District, those are called special districts. So we deal a lot with local government. And it's um, a fun committee because that's the government that's closest to, to the folks, to the folks, to the people. So it's fun to work with the mayors and the county judges. Matter of fact, when Mayor Abramson was mayor for life of Louisville, got to work with him quite a bit as, as the mayor. And they would constantly ask us to do things and fix things and change things that had to come to state government. He never understood that I was his boss. <laughs> never understood that. He laughs about that now. He can laugh about it. Um, another surprise on immigration was that we have about 60,000 illegal immigrants in Kentucky, depending on how you measure it. Some say 50, some say 70. Folks that, have, that are here working for somebody somewhere, farming, roofing, construction, cleaning, restaurants, a lot of people working. They have to work because they are not eligible for any <coughs> government program like welfare or food stamps. So they have to work to make money. And I, and I in dealing with this legislation, I learned that um, the folks that aren't political in nature came to us and said, what, we don't understand, the, they're experts in business and economics came to us, people that we employ, unbiased people in the executive branch, other folks involved in chambers of commerce and so on and so forth, and said, we don't understand the anti-immigrant bias because without immigrants coming to Kentucky in the last 10 years, our population would have shrunk. We would have been one of five states in which the population shrinks. And I, that really surprised me. I had no idea that that, um, that's why the system needs to be fixed. Because immigration, if you know anything about history, is an important part of growing the economy. So we continue to debate that and how to fix it today. Another thing that surprised me is we are building two bridges. There's no other community in America that's building two bridges at the same time. That is, that is unbelievable. That's an Amazing amount of construction, it helps our economy, and we can all pat ourselves on the back because we're building two bridges at the same time. And you know how that happened, right? In an era of people who say they want less government spending, mind you. Well, Congress being Congress, there was a fight on where to build it, downtown or the East End. Where should we build it? A lot of us were involved in that fight. They couldn't decide, so what did they do? <laughs> Well, let's just build two of them and make everybody happy. Not their money, right? Well, we're, we're, that's neat that we're the recipient of that because we actually do need two bridges. So I thought that was interesting. And, uh, people would say, we're, you know, what surprises you as a lawmaker? Those are the kind of things that surprise me. So let's get into House Bill 232. House Bill 232 came about because, remember I told you that we, don't have, we didn't have one. Tried it a long time ago, didn't work out, so we got to have one. And I thought my first allies would be businesses, not the 
consumer that the law protects, but the businesses who are keeping the information in their computer. Because when they're sued, there's no standard. There was no statute in place in which their defense lawyer can say, but the IT department did what it was supposed to do. The company did what it was supposed to do. Step one, step two, step three, step four. They weren't negligent. They were part of a criminal act. They were, they were a victim of someone who broke through the firewall, broke through neural systems, figured out a way to steal information which didn't belong to them. So, I recently first thought about this issue back when I was on a law enforcement task force many years ago when Governor Peck was governor. We had this law enforcement task force where law enforcement people from all around the state would get together once a month, and I was the one guy in the legislature who wanted to be on that task force, so I was the legislative appointment. And mostly it was sheriffs, city police, county attorneys, commonwealth attorneys, um, corrections officers. So it was all about what's law, what, what can law enforcement do, what can we do better, how can we do it better, so on and so forth. And I remember that this issue of, of um, identity theft came up. And this was kind of early in the stage. And I remember sheriffs, now keep in mind in, in rural, well, in most places in Kentucky, <coughs> most counties in Kentucky, the sheriff, you call the sheriff if you want to enforce the law. Something happens, break in, you call the sheriff. If you live in the city like Berea, you call the Berea Police Department, but more likely you're talking to the deputy, the deputy sheriff of um, Madison County. So in most counties, it's the sheriff. So we're at, this, we're at this meeting, and the sheriff of a medium-sized county explained that he had somebody call him. Somebody broke into the damn computer system and stole his credit card information, charged $8,000 worth of money, got all the information, pretending like it's Billy Bob, and they don't know what to do. What do we do? There was nobody in the sheriff's department that had any understanding of what to do, because this was kind of a, a new thing in the beginning of stealing people's information. Um, this is actually before the iPhone, before Android. So it was all laptop, you know, personal computer stuff. And they and, and everybody looked around at each other. You could look by the, the sound of their, room to get your pen drawn. Nobody knew what to do. Luckily, there were two people at the Kentucky State Police who had been involved in this pioneer, groundbreaking area of identity theft, and they had some forensics, and they had some capability with computers, and so they started doing an investigation, and group law enforcement realized, even to this day, how woefully and adequately they're prepared for white collar based crime through the internet, um, stealing people's information. And you wonder why? Because everywhere I go when I deal with this, I say, please talk to the law enforcement person you know. Most of you all know somebody involved in law enforcement, one way or the other. Tell them we need more of their attention in fighting crime involved with stealing people's data and credit card information. We need them to be more interested. And one fellow that I know said, well, keep in mind now, we didn't join the police department to do this kind of criminal work. Have you ever watched cops? What do they do? Chase people high speed? <laughs> Knock them to the ground? Put handcuffs on them? Bust them a few times? Spray something in their face? There's a lot of action and violence. You've never seen a cop's episode of somebody sitting in a computer finding somebody doing something illegal. Never ever have you. Not one. So when you join the police department, you're probably not joining because you want to be doing what you're all doing. That's changed a little bit with the FBI being more interested and now um, larger police departments. They're, they're starting their own section, so you may even work with them. So the, the brainy part of it is starting to change a little bit. That's what we need because of the challenges that we have. Where's the crime going on? Well, as you can see from this first bullet point, 
a lot more crime on identity theft than there is with thefts and burglaries. One in 16 is what the government statistics say is a victim of identity theft. That's a whole lot of people. A lot of that's small, but a big part of it is, is large. But if it ever happens to you, and some of it's happened to you, I'm sure, then anything small doesn't feel small because you don't know what's going to happen next. It may be $100 or less, but you don't know what's going to happen next. So in that last bullet point, when I found out that we were that any statutes dealing with it, what I did is I got together with people that I thought would be interested in coming up with a law because the lawsuits that would happen, um, you could come in as a, as a plaintiff's lawyer and say, they stole my client's information and it was their negligence that caused this problem because not just their security wasn't set up right, but they didn't follow the rules that so-and-so, New Jersey has. New Jersey has 22 different steps and rules that must take place to protect the consumer from theft. I'm not making that up, I'm just giving an example. I don't know if they have 22 or 18. But the plaintiff's lawyer would say, this company didn't do anything about it. And the company would, well, we tried. But what you've got to have is a standard in place, a statute in place, that you can point to and says, well, the lawmaker said we have to do this, and that's our defense. And so the businesses that I worked with agreed that we need some statutes in place that they can point to that says this is what the lawmakers want us to do. They want us to do these things. And that's what I'm talking about my second bullet point. Kentucky Chamber of Commerce, Greater Louisville Link, various businesses like that. And I, my understanding is, is their government affairs people went to some of their IT people and talked about this. And they came back with meeting after meeting after meeting, real concerned that whatever we put in place as law, that we didn't make it so unique that it was a barrier to commerce in Kentucky. Meaning that our law needs to be more uniform and standard. And I agreed, I thought that was a good idea. That's what I went into. I said, look, take the biggest commerce states, who are we doing commerce with? Uh, from state to state, Indiana, uh, Florida, Pennsylvania, Texas, California. We need to be something similar to them because we need some standard and uniform laws in which to deal with. 232 covered the private sector and there was another bill going through by somebody else on House Bill 5 which was the, the um, public sector, address schools and other state and local government agencies because they collect private information too, don't they? And it wouldn't be appropriate to have to tell companies, you've got to do this when the state and local governments weren't doing any of that. So the idea was that we're going to go down in parallel lines and I was going to handle the private sector, the other legislator was going to handle the public sector and try to keep it as uniform as possible. As you, you might not, I don't know if you remember, but that's the, for you all, this would be good for you all to read. If you go to Auditor Adam Eadland's website about House Bill 5 and about what the origins are, he has a report on that, you all probably ought to read that. Because there's things in there that you would like to read that would be appealing to you and interesting to you. And then um, you might be able to give us some, make us some changes. I mean, in a democracy like we have, it's your responsibility to email us or call us and say, what about this, what about that, help me fix this, help me challenge that. Uh, without your all's input, we can't, we can't function very well. If we're not functioning well, I like to blame a lot of it on the citizens because I, I don't do soybean law. I'm not a soybean farmer. But I hear from them quite a bit when there's something dealing with farming. I go to my colleagues and I ask them, folks that I trust on farming issues. What do you think about this? I go to the staff. What do you think about this? I don't know anything about this. I know very little. Uh, I've got some overriding principles, but I don't know enough about it, so what do you think about it? Well, that's what they do on laws like this. The farmers may not have any interest in information security, but they would look to people who do. And we expect you all, as citizens, to give us some feedback that's valuable to me. Not just other criticism about how you hate us, but more about 
Consider this, change this. I'm an expert in this field, and you should do these three things. We really don't hear enough. How many people, when I'm, when I'm in Frankfurt, which is, you know, January, February, March, every day, and then four or five times a month, many meetings and things, uh, when there's an issue we're dealing with, it's on the front page, you're all thinking about it, you're thinking, oh, God, what are they doing there? Wow, this needs to be changed. How many, 45,000 people live in my district. How many people do you think need to call me, email me, or write me, snail mail, before it gets my attention? 10,000 people? 1,000 people? And I ask other legislators this, and it's all about the same. The answer I get back in the way up goes from three people to seven people. That's all it takes. Three to seven people on the same subject. Then I know there's something going on in my district that they care about and have to pay attention to. Because we don't hear often enough about what you want us to do and how you want us to fix it. And so I hope that encourages you, that your voice would be heard, that people would pay attention. And we might not do exactly what you say, but it all is part of the sponge that I am when I take this into consideration because I have to consider other people's interests too. And it's like a balancing act all the time. I want to hear pro or your con. I want to, um, I'm, I'm not this kind of a middle of the road. I don't call myself a politician or a public servant. I'm not a politician because I don't get paid very much. <laughs> Politicians are people who work at it full time, go to Washington, D.C., get paid $150,000 a year, have to have two houses there and here. And I'm, we're not that. We're more, we're, it's a part time citizen legislature. And so I feel myself more as a public servant. I, I don't do politics all day, every day. I don't have to raise $10 million. I have to raise too much money. It still is crazy. But, you know, I, so I feel, I feel more like I'm a public servant. So just a small amount of people that call or write and say, hey, this needs to be fixed or this needs to be changed or you need to pay attention to this or that bill is a terrible idea. Don't vote for it. Something of that nature. And as you see the last bullet point I wanted you to read there, this kind of got government people's attention. That case in South Carolina. That's a whole lot of people. And that's a whole lot of money the state had to spend. That's what got Adam Eaglin's attention, the state auditor, who suggested the state do something. Make sure I got on the right one. Yeah. Now, in this bill, we're not going to go over the, the boring details of it, but I wanted you to be aware of these things. We're not requiring when there's a data breach that the Attorney General be notified or state officials be notified. But consumer reporting agencies must be notified of more than a thousand tokens of breach. You must also notify the person whose information was breached. Keep in mind, we didn't have the law. You, so, somebody broke into the computer system, stole my credit card information, stole my identity, Took, got my birthday, whatever they needed to do to misuse and commit fraud, nobody had to tell me about it. I find that amazing. But that's what this law basically says is first of all, you've got to notify the folks who you've got their information, they trust you are protecting it. And you guys are on the front line with that, protecting people's private information. And that's why. Your companies, you know, count on you all to do that. Bullet number two, the notice can be written, delivered electronically, or be done via a substitute. But if the notification is going to cost more than 250000 or more than 500,000 people, then it may not be possible to direct contact. You can do this electronically by email, which, of course, you would have, in most cases, the email database of your customers. Or you do it like Target did in the beginning. We got a... I got snail mail first thing we got. It wasn't an email. The first thing I got was a snail mail from Target. Which I think people probably pay more attention to now because there's so little of it. <laughs> so many emails you delete and go through so fast. When you get a snail mail with a lot of nice colors on it, you kind of like, it's a little different nowadays. If law enforcement, um, when you notify law enforcement and they come in and learn what the circumstances are. They may decide that they have an investigation they need to do, and they will have the power to hold up the notification for obvious reasons. 
so they can do an investigation to find the bad guy or gal. Okay, now I want to go to the next sl slide here, not the slide, but the next file. Can you help me get to the next file here? <coughs> Oh, here we go. Let's go to this one next. Before we go to the next file. Other information I wanted to give you was our Department of Financial Institutions is now focused with a new task force that wants to detect and respond to cyber criminal activity to preserve our financial system. And actually, they're working with their vendors on that, but they have go to conferences like you all do and I do and, and talk about what works best. The um, you know, there's federal offices like the FTC and the Postal Inspection Service, which also tell citizens how they can avoid identity theft. So the, the, the people want to know what are the steps I need to take to better protect myself. The information's out there. I was surprised that we were tied for 40th on identity theft complaints. I thought we were higher than that. So that's kind of good news that we're not way up the list on that one. And as you see, according to the FTC, government document fraud is the biggest complaint. Driver's license records, social security records, and credit card information is second. So now we go to the next file. Okay. So the legislation did pass. I didn't convince the Senate that it wasn't too much government intrusion. It wasn't too much government, period that we need to protect the consumers and citizens because they expect it. It's, when you go to these meetings of citizens, they're like, why don't you let them do that for? Why don't you fix this? Why don't you fix that? And, and it's very interesting that they call for, more, call for more government, more government work, more government intervention, especially when it affects them personally and they see that they're helped personally and they want more government involvement and intervention. And so, same thing happened. I remember my insurance or a self-insured group, workers' comp group, went bankrupt, and the, and the businesses that were a member of it just couldn't believe the state would allow this to happen. It went bankrupt. Why did you all let it go bankrupt? Why did you tell us it was going bad? And it's like, Mr. Smith, you said you wanted us to stay out of your business. And then, well, not in this case. This is going to help me. So, it's interesting how it kind of works both ways. Now, I just want to spend five minutes with you on this, since my background is, 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 uh, is I broker cybersecurity policies. I would bet that many times, I know you probably don't buy the insurance for your company, but you might cons be consulted on it by your CFO or your CEO or by somebody in the company who says, you know, our insurance expert, our consultant, or our broker, we're telling us that we need to buy a policy because so many companies don't have a policy that protects them from a breach. And they're going to say, what do you think? So I want to give you just a little bit of information about cyber liability policy. Your company or your homeowner's policy excludes losses. The regular liability policy excludes losses dealing with cyber theft. Now you'll see a lot of homeowners policies that you buy are now including, or you need to ask for, the identity theft expense endorsement. And many of them are putting that endorsement on. But for businesses, they have to actually um, buy this separately, this policy separately, since the normal package policy excludes it. These are things you know. Our world is data driven, and with all I make a joke about all this transfer of information back and forth and. Everybody gets scammed, and I wonder if the old-fashioned post office with its snail mail will ever make a comeback. Because I've had old timers come to me and say, "Never, doesn't happen to me. I'm sitting, I check in my mail." <laughs> so it's an interesting comment. As you know, because you're in this business, alarming and growing rates of increase, increasing in size and scope and sophistication. <laughs> So what I want you, so when your boss or when your supervisor or when your owner comes to you and says, what do you know about cyber insurance? I know you're not an insurance agent, I know you're not an insurance consultant, but you need to know what it does and what it's designed to protect the company for. Substantial financial cost 
in remedying, remedying the breach, including the notice, of, the notice and notifying customers. It's now mandated in Kentucky, and what this helps is the cost of that kind of thing. The, the policy also covers the cost of extra labor involved in responding to this. If you, some of you get paid overtime, this policy will pay for your overtime, so you need to tell them to buy the policy, right? What else does it cover? Damage and claims expense for the loss of this data, network damage, and that includes the inability to gain access to the network and destruction or alteration of a third party's information residing on the network. Other losses that are covered are laptop breach, privacy, injury, liability, all kinds of lawsuits coming about because of this type of thing. And that's why, as you read business papers, more and more companies are buying this policy in different limits and in different, you know, they might buy the basic policy, they might buy one that's a lot broader in place because they can afford it and they think it's important to cover those expenses. So I'm not going to give you examples because I didn't bring that. I just want to let you know that um, there's insurance protection out there for companies and when you're asked about it, then you need to be able to say it's protection, look into it. I would, I would never advise you to say ignore it. <laughs> so those are kind of my thoughts and ideas related to the bill. That it's now law, and I don't mind opening it up to questions. Is that okay with you all, with the folks? Um, I didn't bring the law with me, but and if you don't have questions, do you have any good ideas? Well, I need to look out for it. I need to be better at it in regards to information technology. Any thoughts or ideas? Because I know we're not perfect. Somebody want to. Well, if you're, if, you're, uh, if you think of something, then you can communicate directly with us. Definitely talk to your own state rep and state senator about it. Uh, I really think that it's incumbent on you to tell your lawmakers that, look, we need law enforcement to pay more attention to this. It's a bigger crime than burglary or theft. Their resources aren't focused in that direction. Identity theft, white collar crime. Uh, but they're more, they can be more responsive. Now, when I talk to law enforcement, they'll say, we have limited budgets. Give us more money. And what are you going to say? No, let's cut spending. Well, they're going to say, for me to fix this problem, we've got to have more money. Uh, they're going to say, well, we don't want less spending and less taxes. No, 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 we can't have, we've got to have more, we've got to have more. So that's the, that's the balancing act we go for. So at least tell law enforcement you think that that's something they ought to pay closer attention to that you see it all the time, and that would be helpful as we move forward. I have a question in the back. I'll repeat it. She wanted to know how do I use social media to engage with the public, and what texting? Yeah, the way I use it is I have a Facebook page that I put things on that are interesting and I might put or have my staff put on an entry. I don't use it every day, but I use it when things are important about bills and legislation I'm working on or something I've heard that I think my folks who are interested in my point of view might want to see that on the Facebook page. If you're not, you know, if you don't care about government or public policy or the rules that you live by, then you probably wouldn't go to my Facebook page because I'm not putting a picture of my dog on there. I'm not putting, you know, my birthday parties and stuff like that. And that's really for information. I have a, a, a website, stevebriggs.org, which when you go there, you'll love me. You know what it's for. And promote me and to make me look good and all that kind of stuff. Well, the news media is not going to do it, so I've got to do it, right? So when you go to the webpage, you'll see more about my wife and kids and the kind of laws I've worked on in the past and really enjoy dealing with. Um, texting is certainly, well, because I have kids, that's how we communicate. I, I notice folks without kids don't use it as much. Um, Twitter, 
when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm waiting for something or bored with something, I look at Twitter. To me, Twitter is not as, as, as um, I miss a whole lot of it. I just, I'm so busy working, I, mean, I can't check Twitter. So I miss a lot. And so I might use it as an adjunct with my Facebook page and do both at the same time. For example, if I'm going to go to this particular conference and work on something, or have this bill that I'm going to file, I'll put it on Facebook, I'll put it on Twitter. So, Twitter, I don't find to be as helpful because I'm not probably, I'm not probably using it correctly. I just don't spend a lot of time looking at it, and so I'm missing a lot as it goes along. And then, of course, now what I've also learned is, is I'm on people's accounts that I really respect their opinion. I'll go back and look at their page and see, what did I miss? And I'll go back and look at that person's tweets. You know, if I want to know what Coach Cal Perry is thinking, I will go to his wife. Stuff like that. So that, that kind of answers that. Um, if you want to influence somebody or be influential, I think email is the worst for us, public policy. Email is the worst way to go, unless you want our staff person or a college intern to do it, unless you know us, unless we've had some communication with you before, unless you can make a connection with me somehow. Hey, we go to church together. Hey, I was at a conference and I saw you the other day. Um, some sort of connection of real life as opposed to, because everything that comes into us is funnel. You can bet I'm not spending a whole lot of time reading email from Texas from a guy who wants me to put helmets on motorcycles to him. But I don't, I don't have time for that. I got to deal with the 45,000 people in my district. And it's, a lot of it's filtered. A lot of the, a lot of the, that kind of stuff's filtered that comes in. Because if I spend time dealing with people who live in Glasgow, Kentucky, or Huntington, West Virginia, I wouldn't have time to deal with my 45,000 people. And that's who's my priority, is, is responding to them and, and listening to what they have to say. Believe it or not, I still read every letter, every email from people in my district. Um, I get snail mail from kids that are in governor's school, the governor's uh, school of the arts, which is a fascinating program. They still send us two-page handwritten letters when they finish the program telling us how wonderful it is, what they learned, who they met, how broad their horizon, how they're more mature now. And it's, it's basically a government program where we get some corporate money, but the governor's school, a uh, governor's scholars program, sorry, governor's scholars program. So that's old fashioned, but gosh, when you get a handwritten letter, that's what really gets your attention. And, I, and a lot of it I get from retire, uh, people that are, I get handwritten letters, people in their you know, 70s and 80s. They prefer to do one page and send it to the mail as opposed to email. So I hope that answers your question. I think we use it all. I don't know that many of us pay as close attention as you think we should. But we all have our favorite things, our things that interest us. I'm, I'm not going to be, um, you know, my profession, I'm in financial services. I'm working on bills. So that's the kind of information I'm seeking with social media, um, things of that nature. Any other thoughts or questions? I don't want to run over time. We got one fellow way in the back. Everybody hear that? I heard it up here, so you probably heard it. The, um, I think it's going to be left to, to private vendors to contact small business to say, hey, did you know this law passed? And you've got to do these things, and I can help you do it, number one. Number two, the small business groups signed up or approved this legislation, National Federation of Independent Businesses, NFIB, Guardian Guard of Small Business. You should think of them as, you know, I'm stereotyping 20 employees or less. They, they liked it. Um, so the small business groups and the, the each chamber has its own little small business unit inside the chamber. They liked it. So I think it's going to be more of a, you know, we do have, we do have government programs like SCORE. And we have small business type advisory organizations that the government actually you can meet with and consult with. 
some of these folks are retired business people who work there, and, and some businesses will call and say, hey, I need help understanding this. Or they call, they could actually call somebody like me or their state senator, and we would get them to the right person. We would get them to the expert to talk to. So in helping the small businesses understand it, I think that uh, number one is going to be the, the commercial vendors who say, because most of them have somebody that they employ, unless it's somebody in the business, to, to deal with their websites, you know, and deal with this, the um, credit card transactions. Don't ask them, what about this? So naturally, you can go on our website, Kentucky General Assembly or Legislative Research Commission, or read House Bill 232 for yourself, and you'll see what the rules are. And they're not honoring rules. They're not things that a small business person would say, well, this is going to put me out of business. It's, it's really designed to give them a bare minimum set of standards they need, they need to protect themselves with. I hope that answers your question. Anyone else? Yes, sir? How does this relate to any federal, the future federal breach notification laws? My understanding, unless something's changed last year, there is no federal law. They're debating it, they've been talking about it, but they can't come to any conclusion. That's why you have all the states that have one. So the federal, I understand that it's in committee and they keep talking about it, but in our great laboratory of democracy, the states often act a lot faster than the federal government does in many things. So we were the 46th state, so states have already taken the lead. And, and if I were up there, I'd just, I'd, I'd just kind of say, well, the states have already done this. Let's move on to the next topic. But there might be some folks on the federal side who think that the states haven't done it right. So that's always up for debate. And they may supersede us if they want to, but um, I, haven't, I haven't seen that topic gaining ground. They've talked about it because their constituents are concerned about it. You know, the, the people that they represent are concerned about it, so they feel like they need to address it in some way. But I think my understanding is they're learning that the states have, have, have uh, been out way before they have on Wait a minute, you said California notification law? I couldn't hear the last part. What's the California notification law do? So the question is, what about the California law? That's something you probably have to talk to the, the law, business lawyer, but if you're doing business in California, you're, there's gonna be an argument that you're not doing business there. Your, your business is here, so you don't have to abide by California law. But if you're doing business in California, then you are, you are there and have to follow the California law. It would be like, any other law. If you're in California, you have to follow California law. I would suppose there'd be people that would argue that you're not in California. You're only there in the virtual way. And that would be a debate, debate over whether you're there or not. I haven't heard any more information about that. Does anybody Got any, do you have any information about what has been decided? If anything, is that still up in the air?
That's where the federal folks are probably interested in having a more uniform type of law instead of having 46 different laws about what you do and what you can't do. Because, you know, we do that with insurance. It's state-based statutes and regulation and creates a lot of people have a lot of problem with that. And so there's a lot of talk about more uniformity until they talk about more federal government and making it bigger. It's, oh, no, no, we can't do that. So that's, I think what you, I think it's fresh for debate right now about what to do about that. Our standards are different. Our rules are different. And how do you deal with that? Uh, there's going to be people that say, if you want to do business there, you've got to do it the way they want it done. Otherwise, don't do it. And so that makes it more complicated. And that's the cost of doing business. Just like if you send a truck to California, driving your product there to deliver it. You have to abide by California law when you get into their territory. And if you think it's crazy compared to Kentucky, then don't do business there. It's cost of doing business. Are we pretty much run out of time? I think that's about it. I appreciate y'all asking me, and I hope uh, it was informative for you. Thanks for having me.